So I'm on a WhatsApp group with about 20 pals where we discuss everything and anything. A few weeks back, uh, maybe it's a few months ago now, an old friend, Porik, who's also on the group, mentioned this project he's working on called Transcription Week. It didn't really register at the time. Everyone else was talking about craft beer. But it was later that day when I was queuing in the supermarket and scrolling back through the day's messages that I properly read what Porik had been talking about. Now, instantly, I wanted to make a podcast about it. I'll explain more about Transcription Week in a minute. But I might actually let Porik introduce himself at this point, and that'll move things on a little. He's passionate about his work. Here he is explaining what he does. My name is Porik Stack, and I'm the Senior Librarian for Digitisation in Dublin City Library and Archive. So what that means is that I'm responsible for organising, getting our material photographed and put online so that a wider audience can view it and interact with it. It's that word, interact, that really excited me about the potential for a podcast about the new project Porik had mentioned. Now, as I said, it's called Transcription Week, and Dublin City Libraries and Archives are basically crowdsourcing history. They want you to help them. So they've uploaded 50,000 documents, and they want you to help transcribe things like letters to Queen Victoria during the famine. There's all sorts of stuff there. Now, if you've listened to the back catalogue of the show, you've heard about 12 years worth of content. But this is the first time I've been able to offer you the chance to come into an archive to see what I'm talking about and actually work on the documents I'm talking about, all from the comfort of your own home. So in today's show, while I will be looking at letters from the famine, as well as old maps that recorded medieval Dublin before it was destroyed, I'll also be able to give you the chance to check them out and transcribe them. While this is really cool, I have to confess there was also an ulterior motive in making this episode. Pierce Street Library in Dublin City Centre, which houses the archives, is this really cool building. It's somewhere I used to go to write podcasts when I lived in Dublin, but I only ever saw a small part of the building, the reading room. Librarians would disappear behind the scenes and emerge with old documents and books. The chance to get behind the scenes in such a building was more than just a passing curiosity, so I was delighted to get a microphone and head to the library. Now before we plunge into all this story, the letters from the famine, the maps of medieval Dublin and transcription week, I want to take this chance to introduce myself. My name is Finn DeWire, this is the Irish History Podcast and today's show is Getting Dirty in a Digital Archive. When I arrived in Pier Street, the library was being painted and was closed to the public but Porrick brought me in through a back entrance and then took me through a series of corridors at the back of the building into the stores, the place where the archives are stored. Now, before I bring you in there, I asked Porik just to set the scene a bit and explain a bit about the history of Peer Street Library, because it in itself is an interesting story. Yeah, Peer Street Library was originally opened in 1909, and it was the fifth of the municipal libraries. It uh, was commissioned for what was then called Great Brunswick Street, or South Great Brunswick Street, Um, and it was partially funded by the noted philanthropist and really, I suppose, kind of brutal industrialist, Andrew Carnegie. Uh, the first section that opened up was a newspaper reading room and a couple of years later it was followed by a lending library and a reference room. One interesting thing about the lending library when it opened up it was the first municipal library where people could actually come in and access the books on the shelves. Before that you would have to request books individually from library staff. So this was the first branch that had what were then called open access shelves. I will come back to some other features about the building later in the show, but Porik had taken me down to the depths of the building to a storage room. It has row after row of boxes full of archives and artefacts. But on entry, the most striking thing about it is the measures the library takes to protect the rare collections they store, as Porik now explains. The special feature about the door is that it's equipped to defend against floods. So as you come through the door, if you turn to your left, you see... Well, it was basically a big steel barrier uh, powered by pneumatics and at the risk of any kind of flood or actually when we close for the evening the flood defence comes down. It's also climate controlled. Now this interrupts us throughout the show. For example when I was talking to Porik about the collections this happened. So if we look at uh, documents. <laughs> you try and tell me what that sound is Porik. That is uh, part of the air conditioning system. So we're in a climate controlled environment at the moment. Uh, 
and yeah, it occasionally belches and farts. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now let's get down to business. So the project that you can get involved in has 50,000 documents uploaded online. They're waiting for you now. There's a link to the URL in the show notes below. Now I'm going to come back more to that project because I think it's really cool. But one of the collections that they've uploaded are the minutes of Dublin City Council. Now we'll hear about a great letter from the famine that's in those council minutes. But first, Porrick explained where the council came from because it has a more interesting backstory than I'd imagined. So the first one I'm going to show you, Finbar, is our first volume of Dublin City Council Minutes. So there, was, there was municipal uh, reform in 1840 and that brought in the new Dublin City Council. Uh, the franchise was extended to beyond just Anglican Protestants. So for the first time, Catholics, Presbyterians and non-Anglican Protestants could vote. And what you ended up with was not what we'd see as democratic today like the franchise was really restricted to ratepayers but you had a fairly tight balance between catholics and protestants uh daniel o'connell was the first lord mayor and they brought it brought in a system where essentially you would get a catholic lord mayor for one year and a protestant one the next so it brought in an era of power sharing so as we go through the minutes so the minutes were held uh once a month obviously and just to describe this park has taken out a huge tome and it's a very nice handwriting uh, uh is that Dan- yeah daniel that's O'Connor's daniel O'Connor's signature yeah, yeah so as the yeah. first lord mayor Pork then leaped through this huge ledger to december 1845 as the famine was starting to set in and he picked out a letter to queen victoria and on the 10th of december the city councillors sent an address or a letter to the queen just about the famine um and I suppose really the most striking thing in it to me is how apologetic they were for contacting her. So the first three paragraphs are really just laying out that they're sorry to get in touch. Uh, <laughs> just laying out that they're sorry to get in touch, sorry to bother her, but they're sure she'd want to know about the suffering of the people because she's actually a monarch who feels the sufferings of the people. So what I find amazing is the language of it. A lot of the city council minutes are about sort of normal municipal local government things uh, establishment of the fire brigades establishment of a water supply lighting paving that kind of thing but in moments like this you can really see how larger irish history impacts on the work of a city council and you can see in the address what sort of relationship uh, people had or certainly city councillors had with, with the british monarch one of the other things I really like about going into the minutes is you can see the mechanics of the books and actually the mechanics of how people did administration at the time. So the town clerk or one of his assistants would have written up rough minutes uh, every month. And then these would have been transcribed fairly painstakingly in what was called fine hand into these large volumes of about 520 pages. Oh, so this is this is not someone what I'm looking at here that beautiful writing that I'm describing here is not like someone this wasn't done live it would have been okay. done afterwards okay. but based on live notes and then as you can see in every volume there's an index either at the start or the beginning sometimes bound separately and again that would have been done by hand so everything in here is the proceedings of what happened during the meetings letters that went out correspondence that came back in and it just shows you how amazing I suppose that local bureaucracy was at the time now, we left that storage room and headed up a few flights of concrete stairs to where Porik had picked out maps that recorded medieval Dublin before it was destroyed. Now, I love maps, so I was really looking forward to seeing these. But as we made our way up, I asked Porik more about Transcription Week. Now, again, don't forget, this is all something you can get involved in. The web address is europana.transcription.eu. It's a bit of a mouthful, so it's in the show notes below. You can find it there. Anyway, asking all of us, the general public, to get involved in transcription work of these historic documents was not necessarily what we think might happen with such important artefacts. But Porrick explained it's kind of the logical step for Dublin City Library. It's part of the long-standing tradition and mission of Dublin City Libraries to look after the rare historical material we have, but also to give people access to it. So we're a public library. You don't have to be a member of a university. 
Uh, you don't have to have any special qualifications. Anyone can come in once they get a library card. And we want to give as many people as possible access to our collections. Uh, one of the ways we do that is by making it available online. So for this project, we're teaming up with a number of colleagues from six different European countries. And what we're doing is looking at ways to make manuscript items from the long 19th century more easily available to people. Now I stopped him there. The long 19th century, which all the documents in Transcription Week date to, needs explaining. I asked Porik just to define it a bit for you. Yeah, so the long 19th century is as long as a piece of string, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> it's the 18th century and it can be, depending on what you're talking about, from about 1770 to about 1930. It can be longer or shorter depending on which particular country you mean or what, what process you're talking about. So what we're doing is we're digitizing about 50,000 pages right. of documents and we're making them available online. And I suppose the big innovation for us is that we're transcribing them. Now, as I've said, they want you to get involved in transcribing these documents. But if you're like me, you might have imposter syndrome, feeling you're not really qualified to do something like this. But you are... And that's why I wanted to make this episode on it, because I think things like Transcription Week change the way people will relate to history. If you have imposter syndrome, it's natural. Don't worry about it. You can do this from your own home at your own pace. Now, at the other end of the scale, for the more competitive among you, there's also a transcribers board. I'm registered as Finn IHP, so there's bragging rights on offer there too. But more seriously, whether you're interested in becoming a historian or an archivist or you feel it was a missed calling or you're just curious about what an archive is like, it's really fun to get involved in this. This is what Porik said when I asked him if anyone could get involved. Absolutely. That's what we're really hoping to get as many people as possible involved. So I suppose all your listeners at this stage would be familiar with looking at documents online. So usually what you get is a photograph of a book or a letter and it's like a photograph or a, a photocopy. You can see it and you can read it and you can look at it, but you can't necessarily do very much with it. When we get people to transcribe it, what we're going to get them to do is to type out what's on the document and to mark it up. So if you're transcribing a map, you might type up the legend on the map, what the names of the streets are. But what you'll also do is tag the locations so that if it's in Dame Street, you can tag in the geo coordinates. You might also tag the name of the person who owns a particular building or the person who created the map. And really what we'll end up with afterwards is a much richer collection of text that people will be able to keyword search. They'll be able to look for relatives. They'll be able to look for particular locations. Um, one of the really exciting things that people will be able to do is to look at the city that they live in and walk around every day and see what was there previously. Now, as we made our way to the next storage room, we were going to take a look at some old maps. As I mentioned earlier, I love old maps, so these were really cool for me. They recorded medieval Dublin before it was cleared away to make room for modern Dublin. As we go into this room, you're going to hear the climate control again in the background, just to flag that. Oh, that's a really heavy door. <laughs> yeah, it's a fireproof but, uh, door. Yes. Yeah, and this room is full of treasures, really. If you look up above your head, you'll see a couple of maces. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if we poked around a bit more, you might find a couple of blunderbusses. And uh, just, yeah, there's a huge richness of collections in the building. So the catalogue or the collection that people will be able to see online that we're going to talk about here is the White Streets Commission. That's right. Do you want to really briefly explain, not really briefly, sorry, I'm cutting you off there, Parik, before you start speaking, but can you tell people what the White Streets Commission? The White Streets Commission was a public body that acted as a sort of development agency slash planning authority for about 90 years in Dublin's history, from 1758 until 1849. So essentially, the, the name gives it away, their, their primary role was to create new streets in the city to widen and straighten existing streets and later on they controlled the type of buildings that were put in and they tried to create an aesthetic for the building. Um, I suppose the main thing, well, what always sticks in my head, their big achievement was to change the city from a medieval east-west city to what we now know as like a north-south city. So they moved the city uh, boundaries out a lot to the west. Uh, they moved things like the Customs House Quay 
and they put in new bridges across the city. So their big first project was Essex Bridge uh, onto Parliament Street. But even things like what we think of now as the main thoroughfare at Dublin O'Connor Street didn't actually exist before then. There was Upper Sackville Street. So they extend, extended Sackville Street down to the Liffey and put in O'Connell Bridge. Um, and they really changed the city from what was kind of a medieval warren into the modern Hibernian metropolis we all know today. There are tons of these old maps online at the link below, available for transcribing. They're probably my favourite part of the project, I have to admit. Yeah, we've over 800 different maps and drawings, and they're fascinating. They're, what you can see are the sites that existed before the White Street Commission made any interventions. Can we take a look at one of these, maybe? And we'd... Yeah, we've got one particularly good one here from, it's about Parliament Street. And what it does is, it'll show um, the medieval streets that existed beforehand and it'll show what Parliament Street was, it'll overlay Parliament Street. Uh, what's great about it is that it really gives you an understanding of the material changes in the city. We went out to what's known as the Dublin Room, a large exhibition room in Pierce Street Library to look at one of these maps in more detail. Now, this isn't climate controlled, but as you will hear, the painters were working in the background, so they make noise on occasion. Yeah, this is one of my favourite maps. So what it shows is the existing medieval streets and passageways, um, and then it overlays where Parliament Street was due to be put in. Uh, I think what's really exciting about this is it just shows the kind of higgledy-piggledy nature of the city beforehand, and then it actually lists the leases of the different streets and the people whose land was going to have to be compulsorily purchased. Along with the maps, there is a huge amount of documents from the Wide Streets Commission recording who owned various different buildings. When these are transcribed, they're going to be invaluable to genealogists and maybe yourself if you're trying to trace your family in Dublin. Yeah, and I mean, the White Streets Commission is a, a massive resource for that. So what you can do is you could look at this map and then you could check out the references to the map in the minutes. You could see who got bought out when. And then we have another separate 13 volume collection, uh, which are the White Street Mi Commission jury books. And these are when people would have contested the valuations that were put on their property. Trying to get more money off the council. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> and we think of juries now as being something that um, happened in criminal cases. But at the time, they would have been used for things like committing people to asylums, uh, deciding who was worthy of going into workhouses, and in a case like this, deciding how much money somebody should get. So it would have been uh, Dublin laymen, and they would have looked at things like the leases and the rents that were due on properties. Of course, you know, it was a factor of its time. There was no women involved. Uh, the, 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 the class of people who would have been involved would have been fairly restricted. But, you know, it was a layman jury deciding on commercial decisions. This is a real artifact of kind of the modern Dublin that we see today. You know, this is where it came out of is these maps. Absolutely, yep. While there's lots of worthy reasons to get involved in this project, I'm going to admit... There's just a really selfish reason too. And to be honest, it's probably what motivates me most. I just love this stuff. You get a real sense of time and place when you're going through these documents. For anybody interested in history, I think they could selfishly just decide to go on and engage with the historic material to really get their hands virtually dirty, to kind of read through it, see how people spoke at the time, what kind of things were discussed at the time um, and how the city looked at the time and we'd welcome anybody who wants to do that. Uh, and we're looking for people to get involved for as little or as much as they'd like. So during transcription week, people can get involved, they'll be able to log on to the website, transcribe as much or as little as they want. It's the kind of thing you can do from home, from school or from the office. And the big thing about it is you're making a contribution to the amount of knowledge that's available to other people. And also what we're doing is we're building better tools for other heritage institutions. Yeah. So if you go online and you transcribe these parts of Dublin history, we're feeding that into uh, artificial intelligence that in the future will be able to transcribe handwriting automatically. Oh, so okay. by helping out us in Dublin City Library and Archive, you're also contributing to tools that are going to be available internationally.
to a range of heritage institutions. Okay, I think you can hear I'm pretty excited by Transcription Week. I think it's a really great initiative and makes history more open and accessible. Check it out in the link below. Registering is easy and it's a great thing to get involved in. Before I left Dublin City Library in Pier Street, I had to get Park to show me one other thing. Probably the library's most famous resident, the head of Lord Nelson, which once stood atop of an enormous statue on O'Connell Street, but was blown up by the IRA in 1966. Anyone who's visited the library will have seen this. So Park brought me to see Nelson before I left. Yeah, so this is uh, Nelson's head. Nelson's head obviously originally resided on his body, which was on the plinth atop Nelson's pillar in Arcona Street. So after the Battle of Trafalgar, Nelson was massively popular. So there was a huge popular subscription and the statue and the, p- and the pillar were erected in 1809. Um, it was blown up then in 1966 by the IRA and the Irish army finished the job the next day. Um, Nelson's head then had a number of detours. It was kidnapped by some NCID students. NCID is an arts uh, college, just, or an art college rather, uh, uh, just to explain to people at home. That's right, it ended up on stage with the Dubliners and on album covers with the Dubliners and the Clancy Brothers. And then it came to us via the old Civic Museum. So I think Nelson's head is probably my favorite thing in the whole building. Um, and I suppose it's because I think of Nelson as a real dub like Horatio Nelson didn't necessarily have a massive connection with Dublin. Up to about a third of his navy would have been Irish. Um, and obviously at the Battle of Trafalgar there would have been a lot of Irish people fought. Um, and a lot of people in Dublin would have had family and relatives and friends in the navy. So you can see how he was a popular character. But he didn't have a distinct relationship with Dublin. And I think that R. Nelson does. You know, for years and years people who came to Dublin visited Nelson He's in Ulysses, uh, he's a character, you know, he was blown up and that in itself is a great story. He's a long-term resident of the south side and north side inner city. I think he's got the scars to prove it. Okay, that's where I'm going to leave this week's show. You can find links to Transcription Week in the show notes below. Next week, I'm back with an interview about Ireland Redaction, a Nazio radio station that broadcast to Ireland in World War II. A really fascinating story. Until then, Sloan. <laughs>